Hello. Hello. Welcome back. Welcome back to um, Tuesday Night Live. Uh, we have a second of the presentation I'm doing here at the Hudson Senior Center this spring. Um, my name, those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an attorney. I do nothing but elder law. I do that. I can afford to do that because I work at Mark O'Connell. There are 70 of us, 7 out, uh, 40 in uh, Worcester, about 20 in West Row, and 10 in Boston. We're now the biggest law firm outside of the city of Boston. The business center in Boston. And, and because we're a multi-specialty firm, everybody gets to do what they like. And so I get to do this because I'm old. And I like doing this because my clients still think I'm young, which is great. So, so the purpose of this presentation is to focus on elder law for singles. I just, this compliments the one that I had just done about a month ago on elder law for couples. Um, if, if you haven't been here before, although a lot of people have, I see some familiar faces. You know my friends um, Frank and Mary and their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And you know that the goal of their life the parents is to live in their house until they die, be buried in the backyard, and leave all their assets to each other, and then when they're both dead, to divide it up among the kids. That probably sounds like a pretty familiar estate plan. And so, in this case, though, Mayor Frank's, uh, Mary's around, but Frank is gone. He's either gone <laughs> up or he's gone down, but the point is, he's gone. And so now Mary is trying to figure out kind of what to do next. Yeah. And that's a little different because now that Frank's gone, she's kind of lost some options. There were some planning options that are now no longer available. And so we want to talk about those. We're going to, we're going to talk about how she's going to leave things to her kids and whether she wants to leave them directly to her kids, uh, how she wants to deal with grandchildren, how she wants to deal with problems that the kids may have. She is, if, at this point, we're assuming that, that, that Mary is uh, 65 and that, and that she's got... So she's still pretty young, and she's got these concerns. She's got short-term disability concerns. What if I go to the hospital? Yeah. You know, I might get sick, and blah, blah, blah. What do I do? Because at this age, I mean, you can, this can happen anytime. But once you get to our age, it can really happen anytime, right? So it's, it's more of a concern. Second is getting the estate plan right. You want to make sure it's right. Third is ideally setting up that estate plan so that, if possible, you can avoid the probate process. That was easier when it was Frank and Mary because typically they owned everything jointly. So if one of them died, the other one became the owner. Now, though, you got to deal with this, with probate avoidance. And finally, we're going to talk a little bit about estate tax minimization. The reason for that is that for you know a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people have become millionaires. And the reason is because of their real estate, right? Houses have gone up in value. They've got an IRA or 401k. Typically, people here around in, in Hudson don't have $2 million, but I can tell you a lot of people have total assets of more than a million because of those issues. So I'm going to talk about that briefly. So we're assuming these are Mary's assets. She's got a house, $350,000. She's got savings of two hundred and fifty. dollars Her IRA or 401k has got $300,000 in it. She's got an annuity naming one of her kids as the beneficiaries. For two hundred, she's got a total assets of a million one. Her social security check is $2,000 a month. The two things she absolutely has to have, this is the short-term disability issue, right? Are one, a healthcare proxy. She has to have a healthcare proxy so that if she is going to the hospital, um, th then there's somebody else who can make medical decisions for her. Otherwise, there's nobody who can make a medical decision. This is especially important um, now that hospitals are mostly populated by hospitalists, not by your doctor. Your doctor, who used to, you'd see him in the office, and then when you go to the hospital, he'd follow you to the hospital. Now, interestingly, that doctor, if you are in serious condition, in what is called an emergent condition, um, can actually make medical decisions for you without any instruction for anybody if you're incapacitated, if it's an emergency situation. Based on, though, what he knows about you, he can make decisions based upon He's had conversations with you. You're the regular doctor. He kind of knows what you want in these situations, right? Otherwise, he's going to take the most extreme measures. If he doesn't know anything about you, he's going to do everything he can at all times, right, to do everything. And, and so, and, and the only person that he's going to listen to if you can't make that decision is that healthcare proxy, right? So that's the only person that can kind of change his opinion. Because the issue with the hospitalists is they don't know any of that. They don't know who you are, right? They just know this chart. So if there isn't somebody there that they can talk to, they're just kind of making decisions 
on the fly. You don't want them making decisions on the fly for you, right? So for a healthcare proxy, you need two witnesses, and the only issue is that the, the witness can't also be the person you've named in the proxy. It's only effective when you're incapacitated. You all kind of know that. And you can only name one agent at a time. You can't name two of your kids at the same time, right? Because if I'm the doctor and I want to know what to do about you, I don't want to hear two of your kids arguing about this, right? I want to talk to one person. So it has to be one at a time. <clears throat> so how many, raise your hand if you have a healthcare proxy. Just about everybody. Raise your hand if you know where it is. <laughs> That's not too bad. That's not bad. Not two thirds, right? So the question really is kind of, first of all, where is it? And one person who ought to have one of these is your agent, right? I got people who have named people as their proxy, but they don't want to tell their agent. Come on. You know, this happens regularly that folks will go to the hospital and, and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the hospital person will, will get the name of the proxy and call the proxy, or even have a copy there, and call the proxy and they'll say, I am? Like, you don't want your proxy to be saying, I am, you know? You need to tell your proxy and you need to give them a copy, just in case. You also want to give your doctor a copy. I think that's probably the most important one. Because, and your doctor is required to take it and to save it. The healthcare proxy law says that if you give your doctor a, your, your healthcare proxy, he's required to put it in your medical record. And that way, no matter what hospital you're at, whether you're going here to Marlboro or whether you're down at the Cape and you, you know, it was an emergency, blah, 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 he can email that proxy around. It's really, really important. Don't count on the fact that the hospital might have it. You may have done a proxy at the hospital because they made you do it when you went in as a condition of their talking to you because they wanted to make sure nothing bad happened there. But when you left, they probably threw it away. So don't count on the fact they'll have it. In an emergency, you want, <clears throat> let me put it this way, in an emergency, you want somebody else to have it because kind of by definition, you've got a problem. So you can't go look around for it. You've got a problem, right? So it needs to be someplace where they can get it, all right? Powers of attorney. No witnesses required in Massachusetts. Uh, if you get a, a property from out of state, they may be, right? So you need to talk about that. Um, notarization is preferred. Oh, power of attorney, the only time you need a, a, a notary is if the, if the, the attorney may be using the, the power of attorney for um, real estate transactions or other documents that get recorded in the registry of deeds. Um, you can have joint and several um, people named on your power of attorney, so you can name two of your kids. Uh, you can name them either jointly, which means they both have to sign. Usually not a good idea. Just a hassle, you know, or jointly and severally, so that either one of them can sign at any time. So if one of them's out of state, the other one can do it. Okay, and, and, and you don't have to pick between the two of them. Um, and a new one does not revoke an old one. So if you've decided that you don't like the person you've named on your power of attorney, you can always write a new one, naming somebody else. But that doesn't automatically revoke the old one. You also have to notify the first person telling you revoked it. And as a kind of a tip for the wise. Uh, in that situation, if you're getting rid of that other power of attorney because you kind of don't trust that person, make sure you also go to all your financial institutions and give them a letter saying that you revoked your power of attorney. The reason for that is there's a kind of a standard uh, provision in all these powers of attorney, um, which we use all the time, which says that if I, if I walk into the bank with, with the power of attorney naming me as the attorney, and I go to the teller, and I give them the power of attorney, and I give them an affidavit, a sworn statement, notarized, right? That says that that um, power of attorney has not been revoked, and that the person that gave it to me isn't dead. The teller can give will give me all the money, oh. right? And the reason for that is it's important to have that provision in there because otherwise the teller wouldn't give me any money, even if everything was totally on, uh, legit. Because the teller could say, "Well, I see you've got a power of attorney here, but how do I know it hasn't been revoked?" So there's always a provision there to protect the bank or to protect the financial institutions. But the flip side of that is that you need to notify those people that you've revoked a power of attorney, otherwise this could be abused, right? That person with the revoked power of attorney could just walk into the bank and get all the money. Okay? Now, <clears throat> now you, you, you think to yourself, how many here have a power of attorney? Raise your hand. Oh, only about half. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a power of attorney, because you've all got a proxy, you get that. So I'm going to tell you a power of attorney story. I got a guy right now. At, uh, at Metro West in the Premium, what was Premium Union? Who had a stroke? Um, no, yeah, had a stroke. Um, about a couple weeks ago. 
I think he's going to die, but he may not. Uh, he's not in great shape, but if he doesn't die, he's going to be incapacitated. Now, he still he can't physically sign things, but he can still kind of communicate, say yes or no. And so, and he's got uh, a couple of, he doesn't have a house. He has uh, a couple of bank accounts, he's got maybe $100,000 in there. And he wasn't expecting this to happen, as they say. It's always too early until it's too late. You know, he didn't do his power of attorney yet. So now he's got $100,000 in the bank, but nobody can get to it, right? He's the only guy. He's got no kids, he's got no wife. So I talked to his daughter, or his daughter. I talked to his sister, who wants to take care of this, and said, so can you go to the hospital and we'll have him do a power of attorney so that I can get, get access? And I said, sure. So I went. But that was when I found out that he couldn't sign, physically couldn't sign. So I said to the daughter, I said, okay, so sign for his name for him, for him. I'll notarize the fact that he's doing this freely. Yeah. And then bring that to the bank. So we did that. She brought it to the bank. Bank wouldn't take it. Bank said, this signature doesn't match up with our signature in our files. We're not taking this. If you want somebody to, be, to authorize and to sign somebody else to do this, we need a different form. I said, no problem. I got that form. So we do this the other form, which is there's language in the power of attorney that says that the person is authorizing another person to sign on his behalf. And that with two witnesses certifying that and then the notarization. So I do that one, go back to Framingham Union, get the two state he actually has his brother there now. His brother is signing on his behalf, appointing his sister as the attorney, and then we have two witnesses and I notarize it and it's all good. To bring this back to the bank. This is Bank of America, by the way. This is Bank of America. So then the lady goes back to Bank of America with the new power of attorney, and uh, and, I, and 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 calls me that evening, distraught. Bank wouldn't take. It. They had her sitting there. They, they said they called while she was there, like the legal department. They're talking to the legal department. They said they wouldn't take the the, the power of attorney. They said, and and the lady told me, so you you call Bank of America and talk to the legal department. And I said, fine. Um, but I said, so who do I call? And she gave me the number, and I said, this sounds like a you know customer service type number. Are you sure I can just call this number and do this? She said, this is the number. So I call Bank of America, call the lady. She said, yep, here's the number, customer service. And I said, don't I need like an account number or a yeah. social security? Mm -hmm. Just call that number. I call the number, sure enough, I get the robo lady. <laughs> saying, saying, please enter the social security number or an account number. So I call my client back and say, okay, now can I have the social security number and the client? Yep, okay, here's the, now I call back, talk to the robo lady, I punch in the social security, now I get a human being in California who says, and you know, hello, this is, you know, is this so-and-so, the name of the guy, right? I said, no, I said, I'm his attorney, I need to talk about this power of attorney. He said, oh, I can't talk to you, I don't have a power of attorney from you. Oh, right? I said, but I'm calling because your person from Bank of America said to call because I was supposed to straighten this out. Can you connect me with the legal department? Oh no, we can't connect you with the legal department. You have no, you have no permission to do this. I said, she said, and she said, have your person go back to the bank. I said, but she was just at the bank. That's why I'm calling, right? Puts me on, now oh, I, I have to go on hold. Now we're gonna go on hold. Now I'm waiting, I'm waiting. Now it's 15 minutes later. Guy comes back to me, says, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do for you. Nothing you I said, what do you mean there's nothing you can do for me? I got a dying person here, right? I need to be dealing with these or somebody may be heading to the nursing home, so we need to be really re rearranging his assets. I gotta do something. Nothing. And that's where it stands right now. That's where it stands right now. So this person either has to go uh, get a conservator appointed, right? A time-consuming and costly five or ten thousand dollar matter, right? Right? Or just or or what? Or what? There is no what. So note to file: A. Bank of America. Nah. <laughs> B. Get your power of attorney done. You have to have this power of attorney. This is really important, not for you at this moment, right? But it's real. But in case something happens, it's like why do you have a you know life insurance policy? Why do you do this stuff? You have to have this. Okay. That's my power of attorney speech. But right, turning now, to adjourn, I, I, I have a really relevant question to this. But, but you can't ask it yet because I, I'm going to take all questions at the end. Okay, but it has to do with Bank of America. But I'm not going to take it until the end. All okay. Right? 
If you have one, and many of you have a power of attorney, look for these three provisions. First of all, if you do have real estate, and you want your attorney to be able to deal with your real estate, make sure it says that in the power of attorney. I would say about one out of every 10 powers of attorney that I read from other people don't have this. It's very important. Second, gifting. If, you're, if the person who is naming, if the person you're naming as your attorney is to have the power to make gifts, to make gifts to your kids, to your spouse, not your spouse, because we're just talking about this, to your kids, to anybody, it has to be in the power of attorney. Otherwise, they can't. Uh, and, and you want to make sure if they're making those kinds of gifts that there are no financial limits to the amount of the gifts that they can make. Oftentimes, these powers of attorney will have a cap on the amount of the gift equal to what is often referred to as the federal or gift tax exemption amount, which I'm going to talk about later. So now I'll give you another example. Talking yesterday, lady in Lancaster, husband's not well, um, probably needs to qualify for mass health, which means we need to do some asset rearranging. We need to get things out of his name to her because we can do that at the last minute because it's mass health. And then and we have to do some other stuff. And but so she told me about it. Rat, we can, this is all going to work fine. She sends me a copy of the power of attorney. Specifically says the only people that that the husband can give money to are his kids. Why is that in there? Who knows? And also says that those gifts cannot be more than this federal uh, tax deduction amount, $15,000 a year, right? For, so, so I have to tell this lady, there's nothing that you can do with this power of attorney in terms of moving your, your husband's assets around. Because I can't, we can't give it to you because it, it doesn't say you can give it to you. We can't give the kids more than this small amount of money, and that's not going to solve the problem in terms of qualifying for mass health. And by the way, I can't give it to the kids to have them give it to you, because if I'm giving it, if he's giving it to the kids, that money is subject to the look back period, which means for mass health purposes, I can't do this, right? So you got to pay attention to this stuff. You got to make sure the gifting provision is in there. You want to make sure there's no financial limits. That's typically the case. Okay, so just go read it. You know, you have these things. Go read it. Um, now, getting your estate plan right. This is Mary's next issue. She wants to get it right. So, um, that makes sense. And remember, her basic estate plan is she simply wants to give everything to her kids. Right? She's going to divide everything among her kids. Which makes perfect sense. And by the way, that is exactly what would happen if she died owning these assets and she had no will. That's what happens. The, the state has written a will for you in case you don't have one. So if your assets go through the probate process, at the end of the day, after the creditors have all been paid, the assets get divided up. If you have a will, the judge reads the will and says, here's how you divide up the assets. If you don't have a will, there are a standard set of rules, the rules of intestacy. And one of those rules is that if you're married and you had kids and your husband's dead, assets simply get divided up among the kids. So that all works fine. The question from Mary's perspective, though, is, is that what she wants to do? Does any of her children have a creditor problem? In which case, you give it to the kid, you're really giving it to the creditors, right? Or to the IRS, right? Or to anybody that they're owed money to. Do they have a, wedding, a marriage problem? Because otherwise, that money, as soon as the kid gets it, that's part, of the, that's part of what he owns. And so if things need to get divided up in a divorce settlement, that money's getting divided up. Is there a disability? Do you have a child who either is now on mass health, right, or, SI, or SSI, right, or using, uh, um, 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 uh, have the housing voucher, is on Section 8. Because if you do, all of those programs are means tested. You can't have more than a given amount of assets. So by giving them the assets, you may be excluding them from receiving something. So in all of those cases, you do need a will. Mary would need a will that would say probably those assets that would have gone to that child will instead go and trust for the benefit of that child. And you could probably name one of the other kids as the trustee, because as long as the child does not have the right to get to the money, even though the trustee has the, the right to give it to him, um, the, the money is not in play. It's not if the creditors can't get to it, the, 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 bad, the wife you never liked in the first place you can't get to it, and, the, and, the, and they're not, the assets aren't countable if you're trying to qualify for a government program. Finally, the grandchildren. Often, Mary will say, well, I really want to give some money directly to the grandchildren, like to take care of college, for example. And I always tell people, well, that's fine, except remember what you may be doing, really, is giving the money like, to Harvard, right? Because when these kids apply to college, nobody can really afford to pay for college, right? So you apply, 
and then you look for an A package. And then you fill in at least the form called the FAFSA, the, the FAFSA, the one you're required to file if you're looking for federal Pell Grant or other money. And most colleges run based on the FAFSA. And based on that, that money that your grandchild has is going to be reportable, whether it's in his name or in trust for his benefit, right? Um, and may and will probably get subtracted dollar for dollar from the amount of the aid package, because in the college, from the college's perspective, you know they've got limited resources. If the president's got the money to pay, then they should pay. So you just want to be you want to be aware of that. Uh, we talked about that. There are a few other issues that you want to deal with if you're if you are going to have a will. You want to make sure that you're clear on uh, who's running things. And I always suggest you always want one person to run things, or if it's going to be a group, an odd number of people, so that there aren't arguments. You want to avoid ambiguities, especially this is true regarding the house. Um, often there will be something about the house. Oh, I really want one of my kids is living there. He's been helpful. I want him to stay in the house. You know, as long as he maintains, pays the bills and stuff. And so, but you want to really define that. How long can he stay in the house? What are those bills? Are they just taxes and insurance? Is it also maintenance? If there's a major maintenance item, who's responsible for what? So you want to you want that to be really clear, right? And, and that may be a reason why you don't want to put those rules into a will, but into some kind of trust. We'll talk about that. Um, finally, the the um, the oh, and if you're going to be selling the house, first of all, if you simply say in your will, "I leave everything to my three kids," literally, that's what's supposed to happen. Everything goes to the three kids, including the house. And now three kids own the house. So now what happens, right? So now they want to sell the house, and two of them think it's worth $300,000, and one of them thinks it's worth $500,000. So how do you get the house sold? So to the extent that you've got a house, you may in your will want to say, I, I direct that my house be sold and the proceeds be distributed. And if you're giving, giving one of the kids the ability to buy the house, or some kind of special deal, you want to be clear on those terms. For example, the typical argument is over the value of the house. Because, of course, if I'm the seller of the house, the price is always too low. If I'm the buyer of the house, the price is always too high. That's the way it works, right? So you want a clear standard. Uh, most often, as I, su I suggest to people, use the assessed value of the house at the moment that you die. Not because it's exactly right, but because everybody knows what it is, right? And then if you want to give your, children, your child who's going to buy the house some kind of benefit, say that you can get a discount from that standard, 10% off, 20% off, whatever. So that's how you deal with it. Um, we talked about grandchildren. Probate avoidance. So it may be that if you're married, you would just assume not have to go through the probate process. Why is that? What is the point of probate? Well, it's got two points, really. One is to make sure that any assets that you own just in your name when you die go to the right person. So one of the ways to avoid probate, and we're going to talk about that, is just to look at each one of your assets and figure out, where does that asset go when I die? Do I already know? Because if I don't, it's going to go through probate. Right? But the other purpose of probate um, is to make sure that creditors get paid. Um, and creditors, and that's the reason why probate takes so long. Um, the creditors of yours, when you die, have one year from the date of your death to file a claim against your estate. And before beneficiaries can get any money, the creditors have to be paid, which means the probate has to stay open for a year to see if any creditors show up. Because at the end of that year, they're all cut out. Okay, but that's why it takes a year. So the issue is there's always this delay. Now, now there's never a probate, like never a probate, just because of the tangible personal property that Mary has in the house. I've yet to see a case where if that's all you have. It causes a probate. You know, the family just comes in and divides the stuff up, and that's like not an issue. The car is the is, is the asset that most commonly produces an inadvertent probate um, because the car, when when you die, as opposed to the stuff in the house, which if it goes on sale in the yard sale, people aren't going to ask where's the probate. They're going to say, can I buy the the, the the furniture? You know, and they're just going to take it. But the car has a title to it. And the title can't get changed if you die unless somebody goes to the to the registry with a, with a certificate showing that they've been appointed by the probate court to handle it. Right? So you need to deal with the car. One way to deal with it, probably the most common way to deal with it, is, is to put the car in joint names with somebody else, the person that you were going to give the car to. 
because then when your interest, when you die, your interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner of the car. So the car you want to be dealing with. But otherwise, especially if you have that house, um, remember, wills don't avoid probate. Especially, and, and the probate's going to cost you. It's going to take more than a year. It's going to cost some money to go through that process. Um, spending money on, not that I mind that you spend money on lawyers, but you know, if you just, I know you just as soon avoid it, right? So, because it takes, it, it, it just, it involves dealing with the probate court quite a bit. So, uh, this is a quick quiz. There's Mary's assets, remember? And she owns a house, and she has these savings, and she has an IRA and a 401k. Uh, and she has an annuity which is named a death beneficiary. If Mary dies, is a probate going to be necessary? Raise your hand if you think the answer is yes. Raise your hand. Will a probate be necessary? Raise your hand if you think the answer is no. The answer is yes. She's the sole owner of the house. So someone has to figure out who gets that house. So that's going to require probate. And at least the way I've listed it, she's the sole owner of that savings bank. So my guy, that's, my guy that's stuck at Framingham Union right now, if he dies, that, those assets are going to have to go through probate, right? Unless we can get them shifted around before he dies. So the question is, how do you avoid probate? There are actually several ways. Uh, one, and probably the most common, is joint ownership. You simply own assets jointly with somebody else, because when you own assets jointly with someone, legally, you each own 100% of the asset. And when one of you dies, that person's interest evaporates, leaving the other person as the sole owner of the asset. Which means it doesn't have to go through probate. Because we know who owns it when you die. Okay? Um, often that can, that can be used with your bank accounts. Right? You could name people jointly with you on your bank accounts. Now obviously the problem with that yeah. right, is that they're, they're with you jointly on your bank account and they own 100%. So if they go to the bank, they can get all the money. Right? And if, and, if a, and if someone's suing them, they can attach that amount, that account, because it's probably theirs, right? So there are dangers to that, and, but you can kind of weigh that out. That's why you don't want to be jointly with the child that's got a creditor problem, for example, you know, that's got a marriage problem, right? But, if you, you may, so you, but you may have the right child. Alternatively, there are many of these accounts where you can, or, and, and investment accounts, brokerage accounts, fidelity accounts, where you can name somebody uh, POD, pay on death, or TOD, transfer on death. And so none of those funds will end up going through probate. Um, there is the trust, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But finally, you know, one of my personal favorites, not used nearly enough, is last minute giving. So I'm going to go back to my friend in Framingham. So he's got $100,000, and what he wants to have happen is that when he dies, his assets get divided up among his brothers and sisters, right? And so one of the goals of, the, of creating the power of attorney was so that the sister, if she knows her brother's going to die before he dies, takes the money out of the account and just divides it up among the brothers and sisters. That way there's no probate. You avoid probate, right? And, and now I know that people will say, well, I, can't, I shouldn't be doing that. Isn't there this, I can't give, can't give away more than a given amount of money. And, I, and I, if I say that question, how much can you give away in a year? You're going to actually give me an answer. And it's going to be? $15,000. $15, now, I'm going to tell you why that's wrong in a few minutes. But the, but the point is, you can just, and if that were true, then you wouldn't want to do it. But in this, it's wrong. So you can just give everything away. Okay? Finally, though, there's the trust. Um, I mean, by the way, the person who would be doing the giving in that case is probably the person you've named on your power of attorney. Because that's who you talk to. You'd say, you'd say to them, look, I don't want to give everything away now. I'm not dead. And I need the money, you know, and I don't want to give it away now. But I'd rather not go through probate with these assets. So before I die, I'm telling you, and maybe you even want to put it in right, you know, before I die, I'd like you to take the money out and divide it up, right? Now, you've got to trust that person, right? That's the point. You've got to trust that person. But if you're comfortable with that, that's a way of doing it. Finally, there's the trust. If I own assets as the trustee of a trust, instead of owning them in my own name when I die, when I die, those assets won't go through probate because they are controlled instead by the rules of the trust. So if I'm married and I want to make sure that my, I won't go through probate, my assets won't go through probate, but I don't want to lose any control of them while I'm alive, I will do this. I will create a trust. A trust is a relationship between two kinds of people. A trustee, who is the legal controller of property, and a beneficiary, or more beneficiaries. The trustee 
is controlling this stuff for the benefit of the beneficiaries. So if I'm married, I'll, I'll, produce, I'll create a trust. I'll name myself as the trustee so that I have total control of everything for the benefit of myself and whoever else I want to leave property to eventually. I'll say in the trust that it's revocable at any time, meaning I can take the property back at any time. That's what revocable means versus irrevocable when you can't take it back. Uh, I will also say it's amendable. So if I decide I'm going to change the rules before I die, I can. But it's also going to say that when I die, the moment of my death, a new trustee steps in to replace me. Probably Peter, Paul, and or Mary Jr. And, it, and, I'm going to, and at that moment, that trust will become irrevocable because I'm dead. So I can't take the property back anymore. And the rules, and, it, and I'm going to say in the trust that it's unamendable at that point so that they can't change the rules. And I'm going to say to the new trustee in the document, here's how you divide things up. Liquidate means turn it into money. Divide up everything among the three kids. That's what a revocable and amendable trust does. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's probably the most common mechanism that single folks have or, or use in order to avoid probate. Uh, estate tax minimization. Now, remember those are Mary's assets. So she's got a total asset, total assets of a million and one. And by the way, the, 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 remember, the taxable estate is totally different from the probate estate. There can be no probate assets. In this case, we could have done all this other stuff, but still all those assets will be taxable because she was in control of them before she died, and as a result of her death, they're getting distributed. That's kind of the definition of the assets that go into the taxable estate. <clears throat> so assuming she's got those assets, the taxable estate. So, <clears throat> so, she, so she's subject to estate tax, right? The way the estate tax gets calculated is, two, is using two different ways. The first way, which is the, the, the way that was, that was set up when the estate tax uh, system was created here in Massachusetts back in the 20s. When Massachusetts, the, Massachusetts, like many states, unlike the federal government, decided that it was only fair that, or it should, I shouldn't put it, it was only fair, that it wasn't fair that like the kids were getting all these assets for nothing, while the average guy was having to contribute to the government to pay all the taxes, you know, to pay for everything that kind of goes along. And so, and it was during the 20s, it was a period of boom time, people getting wealthy, it just didn't seem fair. And so in Massachusetts, they set up this estate tax, and they said, if you're rich, when you die, then you have to pay an estate. And there's the definition of rich, $40,000, $40,000. So if you had an estate of more than $40,000, you paid an estate tax. Now that doesn't sound very big, and I remember I first read this and I said, geez, that's not much, but then I remembered, so this was done in the 20s. When my father and mother bought their house on French Hill and Marlboro in 1940, they paid $2,000 for that house. And they had to get a mortgage. And they had to rent out the other side of the house, it was a two-family, so they could help pay the mortgage, right? $2,000, right? So what's 40,000? That's 20 times $2,000. We're going to talk a little while in, in a little while about, about the you know the current exemption amount, which is a million dollars. What's twenty times a million? Twenty million dollars, you know. So just to kind of get a sense of what that value is. So anyway, zero to forty thousand dollars, you paid zero, and then there was a graduated system from there, from forty thousand to ninety thousand. On that chunk of money, you paid eight tenths of one percent. Ninety to one hundred forty, you paid one point six, et cetera, et cetera. So go down to the bottom. So if you had a taxable estate using this chart of a million dollars, your estate tax was $36,560. If you had a million one, which is remember Mary's, that's Mary's estate, a million one, your estate tax was $42,640. This chart is still in effect. This chart is still, this chart has never been changed. But wait a minute, you're saying, this is exemption, I don't have to pay a tax if I have less than a million dollars. Well, so historically what happened after this chart got adopted, time went on, Real estate values went up, right? That's really what happened. So that by the 50s, if you died owning a house, pretty much everybody had to pay an estate tax. So they leaned on the legislature to do something about this. The legislature could have changed the chart, which would have been more complicated, but instead they did it the easy way. And what they did was they changed the magic exemption number. And they said, well, the chart's still in effect, but if you have assets of, of more than Instead of $40,000, we're going to say $100,000. If you have assets of less than $100,000, there's no estate tax. And then as time went on, that number went up to three and five and six. 
And then about 20 years ago, it went to a million dollars. And that's the number you know. If you have an estate tax, an estate, a taxable estate of less than a million dollars, you don't pay any estate tax. <clears throat> Which then leads to the next question. Well, what if you have a million and one dollars, right? What happens, right? Now, in some states, and, and Rhode Island was the closest one that's, where this was really applicable, they had the same thing happen. They had the chart, and then they raised this number. But to deal with that problem, they had, they referred to it, it was referred to jokingly as a cliff tax. Their magic number before they changed their system was $650,000. Less than six fifty dollars pay a tax. A dollar over, you fell off the cliff and you paid the entire tax that was owed on their chart, right? Yeah. Yeah. Massachusetts did it differently. <clears throat> Massachusetts said, we're gonna, if your estate is more than a million dollars, you're going to calculate this estate two different ways. First, use the chart. And then use the alternative. And whichever one is lower, that's what you pay. And the alternative is 40% of all the dollars over a million dollars. So if you have an estate of a uh, million and one dollars, you look at the chart, the tax is about $36,560 and like 40 cents or two cents or whatever. Then you look here, oh, it's a million, it's a million and one dollars. 40% of all the dollars over a million is 40 cents. So you know 40 cents. If you had a million one hundred thousand dollars, like Mary does, you owe forty thousand dollars. That's forty percent of all the dollars over a million, right? Which is a lot, right? But it's still lower than the, the chart, which was forty-two thousand six hundred forty. As you can see, and remember, by the way, using the chart, the tax rate on these dollars over a million is like six point four percent. So you can see using the chart. Your, your tax is going up very slowly. Using the alternative, the tax is going up really quick. So these lines cross uh, fairly quickly after a million one. It's about a million one hundred twenty thousand dollars. The lines cross, and after that, you're back on the chart, right? Because the chart number is always going to be lower than forty percent of all the dollars over a million dollars. So if you're married, though, that means when you're looking at this, you've got a real reason. So like, if you're at one million, to try to get below the one, or you're at a million one, to get, get rid of that $100,000, because that 100000 is being taxed at 40%, right? It's really high. So let me talk to you about the ways to do that, if you're married. Well, of course, one way, of course, is you could spend it, right? Just spend it, have a good time. Go on a trip, right? Um, another way, though, is to give it away. But oh no, we can't give it away, right? Because there's this, there's this gift tax. Well, actually, there is no Massachusetts gift tax. By the way, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, and I didn't bring a call. What time is it? 20 minutes. Uh, well, oh, I'm, I'm good. Thank you very much. So, so there is no Massachusetts gift tax. There is a federal combined gift and estate tax system, right? Uh, and the way that works is that if you die with an estate of more than a given amount, $11.4 million, you pay a federal estate tax on the amount above that. Uh, then, in order to make sure that you didn't give away everything just before you died, there is also a parallel gift tax system. And the system is that there's a gift tax, but the gift tax numbers are very similar to the estate tax. So if, if you make a gift, um, then that in any, while there is a gift tax, there are two big exclusions. One of them that you know about, the other one that you don't, right? The one you know about is the top one. Um, uh, if you give more than 50, if you give $15,000 or less to any one individual in any one year, then that's excluded from the gift tax. That's the one you know. The one you don't is the second one. If you go over that number, right, you have, a, you have another exclusion, a lifetime exclusion of $11.4 million, the same amount that was in the estate tax. So if, for example, you gave away, uh, no, I'm not gonna use that yet. So if, for example, you gave away this year $115,000 to one of your kids, 15,000 of that would be subject to that, that, that annual exclusion. The other $100,000 would be subject to your, your lifetime exclusion. And the only thing that you're supposed to do and this is the only reason why you would file an estate or a gift tax return, is to tell the government that, so that they can take that hundred thousand and subtract it from the eleven point four million that you're allowed to leave at death. So if you make that gift this year, 
Then at death, your amount you can give at death has gone down to eleven point three million dollars. To eleven point four million dollars, you get you it goes went down by a hundred thousand dollars. Now, as you can see by the what this these numbers, is it, you're never going to hit the amount of the lifetime exclusion, and therefore there's never going to be a gift tax, right? Now, parenthetically, as I said, you're supposed to file this gift tax return to tell the government about this if you make a gift more than fifteen thousand dollars. But then the question is, if I'm a lawyer, I would, I would pose the question, so what happens if you don't, right? And the answer is, if nothing happens. And the reason for that is that the only penalty for not filing the gift tax return is a percentage of the gift tax you would have owed. But you don't owe any gift tax unless you've exceeded the maximum, the $11.4 million. So it's all a big joke, this whole system, okay? So there's no gift tax. Okay. The, one of the reasons I go through this, though, is it's important in, in terms of the one and only place where this is going to be relevant to you and where it's relevant to Mary. And it happens to be her situation. First of all, if she had an estate, therefore, that instead of being a million one, <clears throat> which is really close to the million, was a million three, and she died, her estate tax would be $55,440. <clears throat> Excuse me. If she gave away 100000 before she died, literally the day before she died, thereby reducing her estate to $1.2 million, right? Remember, there's no gift tax. Nothing bad happens. The receipt of the gift is not income. Nothing bad happens. And then she dies. Her estate is now down to $1.2, which means her estate tax just went down to $49,040. So, so one of the easiest things she can do to reduce her estate tax is to give money away, okay? I'm sorry. It's Right. Um, so that's the main thing. But what about in Mary's situation, right? Because Mary doesn't. Mary's goal here isn't just to reduce her estate tax so that she can reduce the amount she owes under the chart. Mary's goal is to try to get to this alternative tax so that she can get down to that million dollars, not have to pay anything, right? Now. If she does that by giving one, suppose she gives one check away, one big check away um, 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 of $115,000 the day before she dies. The way that will be treated is for purposes of the chart, her estate will have shrunk by that amount to $985,000. The question is though, are we gonna allow her to use the alternative tax? Because if we do, her estate's down below a million dollars, she doesn't have to pay any estate tax, right, at all. Well, if we, it, it, in that case, Mary would not be allowed to do that. The way that this would be calculated is the first 15,000 that she gave away would be totally excluded, and legitimately so for purposes of shrinking her estate. The other $100,000, though, for purposes of seeing whether she can use the alternative tax will be added back in thereby increasing her estate back to more than a million dollars, which means she's going to end up paying an estate tax, right? And the estate tax is going to be the number according to the chart. It's not going to be the higher number, a million or 985 plus the, 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 the 100,000 added back in. It's going to be a tax on that smaller amount, on the 985,000, but she's going to pay a tax through the under the chart. If Mary's goal is to basically go from a million one to a million dollars quickly, therefore. The only way she can do that is by telling the person who's got that power of attorney, before I die, and this can be the day before I die, give away seven gifts of $15,000. Give one to Peter, Paul, Mary, some of the grandchildren, my best friend, I don't care, just give them away, right? Thereby decreasing my estate below a million and doing it in a way that, that is, 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 is only giving away these chunks of money of less than $15,000 per person. <clears throat> so in Mary's particular case, if she's waiting until the last minute, that's how she can avoid the estate tax, right? Very quickly. One other way would be to give some money to charity. Uh, uh, gifts to charity are, are simply deducted from your taxable estate. So if she had something in her will, for example, it said, because she was running close, she was a little over a million, it said, Whatever my taxable estate would otherwise have been, I'm giving away a sufficient amount of money to get down to a million dollars to St. Michael's Church, to the hospital, to somebody, anybody. 
If she does that, then basically she's given away that top money that she was otherwise going to be paying 40% tax on anyway. So she's really just giving like 60 cents, and she's getting the government to kick in the other 40, right? Really. So, and, and, and completely avoiding the estate tax. Uh, we already talked about that. <clears throat> now, finally, what about if Mary is 80 instead of 65? Well, in that case, she's got a couple of additional concerns. Her major concern is that there are two. First, it's clearer that death is coming. Death is coming. Death not, may not be coming tomorrow, you know, but it's coming, right? It isn't like there are, to me, there are like, there are like three, there are three kind of stages that you go through. One, we're all past. And that's like your kids. Oh, I'm never going to die. They don't really believe they're going to die, right? <clears throat> then you get to our stage. Yeah, death is coming, but not in the foreseeable future, right? But then you get to that point where death is coming in the foreseeable future, yeah. right? You know? And so you're starting to think about that stuff. So in addition to making sure you have your proxy at that point, um, you really want to make sure, and I'm not going to go through that, you really want to make sure that you've had that conversation with your proxy agent about how you want to be treated if you're not doing well, especially if your life has become kind of more measurable in terms of how long that you have left. Now that could be a week, it could be a day, it could be a year, it could be a long time. But the point is that during that time, if you had a stroke or if you had serious memory problems, there may be any number of reasons why you can't make that, those medical decisions. So take my example. Say you've had that stroke and you've had some strokes before and so your head, health has kind of deteriorated, you know, and so you're not in great shape, you're still living at home or you're living in a nursing home, right? And you're getting a lot of care, right? And then you get pneumonia. And so the question is, do you want to go to the hospital? <clears throat> now, of course, if you go to the hospital, <clears throat> chances are that with their super-duper drugs and all, they'll cure the pneumonia. But they're not going to make you any better than you were before you went to the hospital, right? So the real question in that case is, do you want to go to the hospital, right? All of my clients say they want to live in their house until they die. I think 10% of people now live, die in their house. 40% of, more than 40% of people die in nursing homes, right? A significant percent die in hospitals. The main places you die are in the nursing home or in the hospital, right? Do you really want to die in the nursing home? No. no. Do you really want to die in a double? You know, I think that's right. And there's somebody else on the other side of that sheet because everybody's in a double, right? You know, I mean, we're going to talk about some of that stuff a little later. But the point is, the point is, you, you know at what point you would just say, no, nah, I don't want to go to the hospital. But if you can't communicate that, your proxy needs to know that, yeah. right? You, they really need to, otherwise they're gonna feel guilty and they're gonna send you to the hospital. So you gotta have those conversations, okay? We're gonna talk about more about this, I know, this fall. This is a really important issue, a really important issue. But also, as far as Mary is concerned, because she is, now she's really worried about this possibility of needing asset protection um, in case she ends up in a nursing home. The reason why is she, she knows that, that, that um, it's a very simple statistic coming from the Alzheimer's Association. If you're 65, um, your chances of spending a prolonged, getting a disease that causes a dementia, spending a prolonged period in a nursing home, are one in nine. If you're 85, they're one in three. The reason is, if you've made it to 85, if you've made it to 85, that's kind of the remaining disease. If you had cancer or heart or whatever, you're already dead, right? So this is this pool. So you get to a certain age and you say, I got to prepare for this. So I'm just going to mention a couple of things about. First, if you haven't done that, or your friends haven't done that, and you've heard about this, and they're in the nursing home, they're like, oh my God, I didn't do anything. Remember, you can always qualify for Mass Health. Always qualify for Mass Health, and probably want to. The reason why Mary's worried is because she knows the nursing home bill is going to be about $14,000 a month. Her income is $2,000 a month, which means her burn rate, the rate at which her money is going to evaporate if she's in a nursing home, is about $12,000 a month or 144000 a year. She wants to qualify for Mass Health because once she's on Mass Health, um, she'll have to keep paying her $2,000, her Social Security, to the nursing home. But Mass Health will pay all the rest, right? She can always qualify. She can do that because if she applies, she can qualify because the house isn't countable. She can't have more than $2,000 in, in countable assets. But she can take all of her money and use it to do one of two things. First, buy an annuity. 
Um, and second, and there's some rules to that annuity, which I won't go through right now, but buy an annuity. Or second, transfer the remaining money to something called a D4C pooled trust. We've talked about these before. These are trusts for the benefit of the senior. The money can all be used for Mary while she's in the nursing home. MassHealth will have a lien on any remaining annuity payments or in any D4C money and on her house after she dies to get repaid for what they paid. And so you say to yourself, why would she do this? The answer is simple. Once she is on Mass Health, that same bed in that same nursing home that on private pay costs about $14,000, on Mass Health costs about $7,000. If she's got a monthly income of $2,000, the gap is only $5,000. If she doesn't pay that gap, that's the rate at which the lien will accrue, $5,000 per month. If she buys an annuity that will pay her $5,000 a month, right? And she's got the assets to do that, right? She buys an annuity to pay her $5,000 a month while she's alive. Then at the end of the day, once she's on, and then she gets on Mass Health, at the end of the day, Mass Health isn't paying anything because she's paying $5,000 from her annuity and $2,000 from her Social Security, and the Mass Health bill for that bet is only $7,000. So there is no lien. And at the end of the day, she ends up saving all of the rest of her assets for her kids, right? But if she doesn't, if suppose she's actually trying to plan ahead here, she can also protect those assets, and you've all heard about this, that's why I'm not spending a lot of time on it, by giving them away. It's the only way to do it. You have to give them away and wait five years. Or get married, which nobody ever wants to do. I always suggest that. <laughs> because you can give assets to your spouse right away, even if you just married, right? But no one, no one does it. So, and you can pay him for it. You can pay him 50000 Look, I want to marry you, right? You're going to save a boatload of money, and you don't have to sleep with them, right? You're going to the nursing home, right? You're just doing it for your kids. But nobody ever does So anyway, to, so anyway, if you want to do this planning, uh, you have to give the money away and wait five years. And, and so she could do that with all of these assets. Um, she could just give it away to, to one or all of her kids. Now, she wouldn't do that unless she really trusted them, right? Because... What she's really doing is saying to her child, well, you know, I'm going to give you these assets, but if I need them, I really want them back, right? So you've got to trust that, A, the child's going to give them back, right? And B, that they're still going to be there because the child isn't going to get sued, or isn't going to be part of the divorce, whatever. You know, you're not, you've got to trust that. If you're worried about those things, and so you don't want to just give the assets to the child, that's typically, oh, and you, one other thing, regarding the house, you wouldn't give the child a house you would give the child a remainder interest in the house. You keep a life estate in the house, give the child the remainder interest. So you'd have total control until the moment of your death. But at the moment of your death, your life estate would evaporate, the child would become the sole owner of the house. Five years after you've done that, that remainder interest is protected. If you then need to go to the nursing home, Mass Health will put a lien on the life estate, but when you die, the, your life estate will evaporate, as I said, and therefore so does the lien. So that's how you want to handle the house. Um, I won't go through that. Um, um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about that. The irrevocable trust. The alternative to that, if, as long as you've got at least one child that you can trust and who's financially stable and the marriage isn't breaking up and all that stuff, right, is that you create an irrevocable trust. Irrevocable meaning you can't take the property back. You put assets, anything you want to protect, you put it into the irrevocable trust. You name the one you trust the most as the trustee of that trust, and you say in the trust, that that trustee has the right to distribute some of all of those trust assets at any time while you're alive to one of the other kids. You're, you're trusting that in that case, the trustee will do that and whoever they give it to will give it back to you or use it for your benefit. But then the trust would also say following Mary's death, the assets will get divided among the kids or whatever you want to say. That's the irrevocable trust. I don't spend a lot of time on this because you all know this. I mean, we, we've all, you've all heard of this. Um, you can't be the trustee, right? But you can uh, have the control over who the trustee is, so that if it turns out that child wasn't dependable, you can retain the right to dump them and name somebody else, like one of your other kids, or somebody else, your lawyer, somebody you trust. No. <laughs> so <clears throat> you can name, you know, typically the distributions are to the, are to the kids. They can't be to you. Um, and there's no way, and, and you want to make sure that the trust does not give you the power to get the money, the legal right to get the money back or the trustee the, the discretion to give you the money back or to loan you the money. And finally, you don't want to allow any transfers to nonprofits. That's a kind of piece of trivia. Um, I'm not going to go through that. That's it. So if, 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 if I talk too fast and you want to see this again, as you know, thanks to the kindly help of Hudson Cable TV, which I really appreciate. Thank you, Hudson Cable TV.
These shows all go up on, on cable. Um, and, and in addition to that, Frank and Mary have their own YouTube channel. I'll go off Frank and Mary so you can see from there. Uh, but remember, the goal of life is always to sleep well at night. So if none of the, you don't worry about any of this, well, that's okay. But if, I often have, I have a lady that came today, actually a few weeks ago, came and said, you know, we were thinking about doing something, and so we came to see you a couple of years ago. Well, it was actually seven years ago. Well, we think it's finally time. So now they're doing something. So that's okay. No, now they work. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, the question I have is, if you have IRAs and annuities, yeah. and you have a beneficiary, yeah. that is okay? Stays out of going to probate? So the question is, if you have IRAs or, or, or annuities, and you have a death beneficiary, does that avoid probate? Yeah, that's all those things. That's what I'm saying. Yep. That's yep. fine. Yep. Just fine. Just fine. Yep. Okay. I, I just want to be quick. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Is the power of attorney, yep. is it good forever? Forever. Powers of attorney are good forever, but we always tell people to redo them every five years. The reason okay. for that is the laymen who are deciding whether they're any good don't know that they're good forever. Yeah. And we'll oh, have to look at an old one and say, oh, that looks stale. I'm not going to take it. We've had that happen. Mm -hmm. Any yeah. other questions? Yes, ma'am? Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sure that your hand was up, and then, then you, ma'am, and then we're done. Yes, sir. I have a couple questions. Yep. Uh, back. Okay. A while back, you had a slide that had five wishes on it. Yep. You didn't really say anything about it. I was going to talk about the five wishes and how much I don't like it, how much I don't like the use of the form. I think that the form really is focused on really end-of-life decisions, which are really a very small set of decisions, and contrary to what the form appears to say, it's not legally binding. Um, I think the better thing is to have that conversation with your doctor about what you know what your real feelings are about how you would want to be treated, and then put something in writing that expresses so, those. Feelings. So that you would not recommend that to replace the the um, the, uh, the other. I would not recommend that to replace anything. Okay. All right. Now the second question. Those are two, but I want because I want to make sure this lady gets All her right. question, and I want to make sure that I think I've got about two minutes before the before one o'clock before two o'clock. What time is it? It's 158. I think I, one question. I'm okay. taking any other questions after I'm done. I just want to. Just, I don't want. To, I don't want to screw up the cable station. Yeah. Okay. I have a Bank of America calculator to see my Social Security and my annuity every month. Yeah. And they were both stopped and I'm dead, and I pay my, my bills yeah. from the same account. Yeah. If my son has access to it, but I don't have any paperwork saying that, that he's the owner. Do I need an additional piece of paper? The question is, you have accounts at uh, Bank of America. Yeah. And you say your son has access, I'm a, but there's nothing that says he has any ownership. I assume that means because he has a power of attorney. Yeah, he does have a power of attorney. So, and if that's already on file with them, then, okay. I, then it's probably going to be okay. Okay, it's not on file with Bank of America, so I should make sure. You better make sure that they're going to accept that power of attorney. Okay, one ahead other, of time. Okay, one other very quick, regarding ownership of car. My, uh, if you have joint ownership of car, the other person, child or grandchild, can get, get in trouble if you have an accident to pay or whatever. So, so my insurance agents told me that, that, that if I just sign the title and put it in my safe in the bank, then, then when I die, whoever wants the car can just sign and they would be I, I have I have seen that done. Yeah. I have seen it done that as an alternative to putting somebody's name jointly on the car, yeah. the person who owns the car will sign the title, yeah. right? Uh, even though it's not dated, exactly. so it's that dated. so that when the person dies, some person who is trying to stretch the law can go in with that car, with that title and get the car transferred. As a lawyer, I can't advise you to do that. All right, I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much.